Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Steve Tatiosh from Infineon. I'm going to talk to the, today about MCUs at the edge. Steve, when we think about the microcontroller market, it's really changed over what it was in the past. In the past, it was pretty much a very small compute element tied into memory that was on chip. And that was really the definition of what was a microcontroller versus a CPU or some other type of, of device. What's changing now? What does an MCU actually look like today? As we look at the future and what's happening today in the MCU market is we're starting to see a lot more compute capability and a lot more compute requirements uh, landing on these on these devices, largely driven by what's happening with machine learning. So as the machine learning software and models continue to develop and in many cases get smaller and more capable, they start to fit onto MCUs or both from a performance kind of uh, range, but also from a, a memory footprint perspective. And right now, I think we kind of have a, a perfect storm with what's happening is as we continue to develop more advanced MCUs, both in terms of scalar and DSP performance, but now integration of neural net coprocessors and the software becoming more and more efficient, we start to see those capabilities really get unlocked in a cost and power effective way like we haven't seen before. Going back maybe three, four years ago, everybody thought that when you move uh, computing to the edge and even AI to the edge, you're gonna need some very powerful processors. Has the MCU become that much more powerful or has the software become that much easier to run and, and much slimmer, uh, more pruned, or is it a combination of both? It's really a combination of both. But what I will say is that in the context of have the MCUs become more powerful, um, they've done that, but in a really special way, okay? It's not, lat the previous generation was 200 megahertz and now we're 400 megahertz. It's, yeah, the previous generation maybe was 200 megahertz and this is, the new generation is 400 megahertz, but it also has a neural net coprocessor. So we're not talking about for these machine learning applications, be it voice or vision or maybe radar for activity detection or, or gesture recognition. This is not, they're, they're twice as effective. It's like they're hundreds of times more effective, maybe even a thousand times more effective in terms of performance. And that is of course being enabled by, by the software itself becoming smaller and more efficient as well. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Steve, what are we looking at? So here's a capability uh, view of our new generation of ML ready microcontrollers from Infineon that we call PSOC Edge. And if I start at the top, you know, and we were just talking about, of course, the, the performance and, you know, as I mentioned, you know, up in terms of scalar performance with the Cortex M55, but also adding really nice DSP support with the Helium DSP extensions. Paired with that, uh, you know, and I think this is a common architecture becoming more common, let me put it that way, in terms of a high performance domain, as well as a low power uh, compute domain. So we pair the M33 with, with the M55, where the M33 is in, in specifically in a low power domain, where we also have some embedded RAM. And, and, and that's on the, on the compute side from a more traditional perspective. But then we also add neural net coprocessing that I mentioned earlier. Earlier, So we put the, in this particular case, the, the Ethos U55 paired with the M55, which brings a really high performance capability in terms of machine learning. And then in the low power domain, you can see here, we have this thing called NN Lite, which is a really lightweight, yet really, I'll say powerful uh, neural net paired with the M33. And this really enables always on operation for things like uh, voice detection or other activity or sensor interfaces where you want to be able to understand what's happening in the environment while you're in this low power mode before bringing up the main the main compute engine. Additionally, on these types of processors for that are really ML rich, you start to see more and more memory uh, on chip and more uh, capability for uh, high performance memories off chip uh, as well. One consistent trend in the industry is around security. So being able to both protect the, the user data, but also the, the system itself from harm, as well as then the developer's code or IP that are on these devices. So you start to see more and more embedded security on these products. And then, you know, the intent of course, to be really there in terms of the enablement for the customers. So a wide range of tools and, and development systems as well.
Well, let's take some of these individually. How low can the power go on these devices? We tend to think about MCUs as uh, in the past they were were low power, but they weren't the lowest power. How far can you go down? How granular can you get with that power? Yeah, great question. So um, I just give you an, an example with the the this top architecture right on this chart here with M55 and, and M33. So again, it's it, there's two domains on the product. One is this high performance domain with the M55, U55. That is a domain that only needs to come on when there's a, a, a large amount of compute performance required. So typically that is in some kind of off or standby mode. And really then what happens is the, that M33 domain, which is really a dedicated low power domain is, is up and running. And within that domain, there are even levels of, of power, which are more traditional, like your sleep, deep sleep and hibernate modes. So the developer can select the right mix of power consumption and capability needed at any given time. Now, to give you an example, a product like this can do a, a really rich machine learning use case, leveraging the M55, U55, and that might be you know, interfacing to, to a radar and tracking people through in a room, for example, as they move around and knowing who's sitting down and who's standing up. When that use case is no longer active, for example, the room is empty and it detects that, then just the M33 domain would, would remain on in some in, in, in some sleep mode. And, and there you start to talk about the battery life that you might find today in your smoke detector in your home uh, or your remote control for your TV. So very low power uh, capability, um, just like a little tiny MCU of yesterday. When you think about the MCUs years ago, they were pretty much all or nothing. So if you went into a low power mode, it took a while for it to wake up, but the entire chip shut down. Do you now have some sort of granular control that says, hey, we can turn off certain parts of this chip and, and not other parts of, of, of the chip, or is it all still all in one? Absolutely. And I, I will give a, a specific example there within the high power domain, for example. So you may have thermostat with a really rich display on it, right? That, that There's a GPU on this product that would control the display and render the image but you'll be using the ML the, the, uh, and the performance of the CPU to do voice control or command uh, and talk to the, to the thermostat. Well, being able to have continue to use the high performance domain through voice command, but then shut down the GPU to save power and shut the display off, which will even save more power than shutting the GPU off, right? You're able to do that in this, in this type of processor. And I can even go a step further, which is then once that thermostat kind of detects that there is no more immediate human interaction through voice, it can shut down the next step and the whole high performance domain shuts down, for example, and just that M33 domain is on and is just listening then paired with the NN light listening for what it thinks might be a wake word. And if it hears that, that, that word, then it will process it. And when it determines with some high probability that it is it, then it will pass it on in the incoming audio stream by waking the high performance domain back up and then taking on the full command set. What happens on the, the memory side? So in the past, a MCU was memory bound by whatever would fit into the chip. Now it can attach to external memory. What kind of memory capability do you have there? That's a great question, and you're absolutely right. The external memory is becoming more and more important, and it, because of the size of the amount uh, for some applications and the range, right? So some applications may require four or eight megabytes off chip, or, or I'll say the total memory, and that would be off chip. Uh, and others might require 32 or 64 megabytes of memory. And, and being able to handle that range on a, on a monolithic MCU with all the memory integrated really is not practical. So being able to support external memory, whether that be non-volatile memory, like a, like a serial flash or NOR flash, as well as expand the system RAM with, with external SRAM is important. And we do that through traditional interfaces like, like SPI or QuadSPI, OctoSPI uh, type interfaces. On the security side, two things have changed. One is related to what you're talking about here, where you're now saying, we have external memory. How do we secure that in addition to the chip? Because uh, you basically widened your attack surface. The second thing is these devices are in the market typically longer than they were in the past. In the past, when you had uh, a lot of these MCUs, they were pretty much, or they were going to be one function, they're going to be pretty limited, and, and you knew exactly what it was going to do. Now you don't necessarily know that, but it's probably going to be in the market a lot longer than what you had in the past. How does all that change in terms of security? I think what you're getting at there is the reality that security has a has a life cycle. And 
you know, something that we as an industry may have considered secure five years ago may not be considered secure today. Um, security for embedded processors is typically uh, defined as kind of the time and the cost to break it. Um, it's not a matter of, of can it be broken. Most security experts would acknowledge that all security can be broken. It's a matter of how long and how expensive it is to break it. So something that if we put a, a bound on it and say, you know, maybe five years ago it would have taken, you know, somebody six months and $100,000 of, of equipment to, to break, maybe you know, today that may be one person for a month and a $500 probe or something like that can break that security. So security certainly has a, has a life cycle associated with it as the attacks capabilities become more sophisticated and the equipment necessary uh, becomes more widespread. So the way we address that, of course, is by designing our security for the future. So kind of future proofing that well above and beyond the requirements for today and looking ahead, you know, five, 10, even 20 years in terms of what we think might or could happen in terms of the development around what uh, malicious actors could bring to bear on these types of products and design for that. And you see that in the way that, you know, security standards for these types of products are evolving as well. And you see that in the market in terms of what Infineon is doing and frankly, what, what other MCU suppliers are doing in terms of up-leveling up -leveling the, uh, the MCU security. When you're creating these MCUs and building them into systems, you, you need some flexibility built in there because nothing is standardized anymore. Everything is going very customized as we start going down into different vertical markets, uh, different use cases, different workloads. What's available in the tools today? What's missing? And how is that going to change in terms of how people work with MCUs? On the tool side, I think there there is definitely the, the topics that you bring up there around more customization, more application uh, specific uh, requirements, and the tools need to be able to address that. Uh, I would also overlay the how it's getting done, right? So what may have traditionally been done one way might get done a different way today today or in the future. And then a, 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 another uh, vector here when we think about the tools is the developer themselves. So some developers are, are you know, highly skilled and, and, and they want to work very close to the product. And then there are other developers who, you know, code development is not their area of expertise and they want to get to a, 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 at least a proof of concept uh, as quickly as possible with as little effort as possible. Um, so the tool chain needs to address the range of developers uh, as well as the types of things or the application specific requirements that those developers are gonna come upon. The way that we do that, of course, and I think you, you see that as an industry trend is more and more either application or function specific tooling as well as from a development perspective. And, I, and an example of that might be, you know, how you tune a motor or how you develop your, your machine learning model. And then there's this other vector around configurators. So I don't need to go in and change parameters in, deep into my code. I have a tool that is uh, simple to use and interact with, but I can still get much of the benefit of going down deep into the code by changing parameters through this configurator. So I think we see those two trends continuing. Um, but new things being added into those th those trends. Where do MCUs fit in with machine learning? Because in the past, they were pretty much never really thought about in the same sentence as, oh, we can use a, a microcontroller and we can do machine learning too. Tiny ML has, has come a long way and is really moving, I think, in a very sophisticated way uh, as well. So we're not necessarily talking about, even though it's still relevant for MCUs, these kind of initial use cases around uh, anomaly detection uh, or predictive maintenance uh, through an IMU vibrating differently than it was before based on a, a bad bearing or something like that. And I think those those use cases are, are well understood and quite capable to do in a, in a large variety of MCUs. But now we're really starting to see the rich capabilities that machine learning can bring and that has traditionally been either done in the cloud or on a more expensive and, and power hungry apps processor, um, we're starting to see those capabilities come into the MCU. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, that's in part because of the MCU performance is going up, but also because we're integrating neural net co-processors as well. 
uh, and then being able to really, in a cost-effective way, support larger memory requirements, both on the on the on the data side and on the model side, and do that in a relatively high-performance way. How do you actually see this rolling out in terms of different applications? So that's a great question. Let me show you here, and this kind of goes back to what I was just saying around the types of use cases supported on on let's say an, an M4 or an M33 class processor like this PSOC 6, and then moving up to these PSOC Edge devices, which are these M55 plus U55 in the high performance domain. There's a range of capabilities in any one of these given boxes um, around, for example, anomaly detection. It can be very basic or very complex, and that's why it, it, it ranges through these uh, different kind of class of processors. But where we see this evolving, for example, is, is we see the MCU starting to do things that again, only as processors or dedicated NPUs have done in the past. And these are things like object detection and tracking, face recognition, position detection, natural language processing, beam forming, um, noise suppression and echo cancellation. So these things that, again, have traditionally been done in higher end products are now able to do with machine learning in mid-tier MCUs. And how low do you see the potential for pushing the power down? And I think it's significant. So again, it comes back down to um, two things are happening at the same time. Is, is one is more integration of more dedicated and optimized hardware on the on the NPU side or the neural net processors on these uh, MCUs, but then also the software footprint coming down. As there's less code to process, that all obviously has an impact on, on power efficiency as well. One last question here. Where are the standards starting to come in? So we, we had standards like Matter. How do they start applying into this part of the market with the MCUs and what will change over time? That's a great question. So Matter specifically, I'll just start there, um, continues to roll out, of course. And that if we're talking about Matter on uh, over Thread, that is an MCU domain uh, largely today. Matter over Wi-Fi, you know, it depends on, on, on the hardware configuration, uh, but support for matter running on an MCU next to a Wi-Fi device also well supported and I think I think being being rolled out. Other standards that I think are, are really relevant here um, specifically around the edge and, and, and how machine learning is proliferating is back to security. So we see standards or like PSA for example and government regulations um, that are influencing you know the products and the software. Um, and then the other place is around um, privacy and security. And of course, that comes back to the security-based standards as well. Steve Tatiosian, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.